Hello everyone. Welcome to this video on five keys that you need to unlock Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Five changes you need to make in order to make the transition as easy as possible for yourself and to, I think, get the most benefit out of Curse of Strahd uh, and meshing it really well with the Shadow Dark system. It works really, really well. Shadow Dark has an emphasis on danger, an emphasis on fear and darkness that I think fits really well with the gothic horror vibe, vibe of Curse of Strahd. And 5e it tends towards a more superhero-y system. Nothing wrong with that. But I think that Shadow Dark is a great alternative for this particular adventure. But it does require some changes from 5e and some changes in the way that you think about the adventure. If you're just taking the book as it is, you're going to have to do a lot of homebrewing. And here are five ways, I think, that can really help uh, meld the system well with Shadow Dark, um, but also smooth out some of the edges. And the first thing you're going to want to do is rework Strahd himself. And I don't mean rework him in the way that you would for 5e. One of the things that we know about Strahd is that he is obviously really, really good <laughs> at building that sort of dread in the background and being a great villain that you eventually come to meet. But rules as written, Strahd is pretty weak, especially for higher level 5e characters. And so most DMs want to rework him, right? They want to make him stronger, give him more spells, give him more attacks, make him better in that way. Well, in Shadow Dark, you similarly, I think, you need to rework the base of Vampire stat block, but you can't do it in the way that you would for, you know, 5e. You have to do it in a different way. And I think the way to do that is to focus more on uh, giving him out-of-combat abilities and giving him abilities that allow him to shine in those non-combat scenarios. D&D 5e focuses on those long, drawn-out, flashy combats, right? And so the sorts of abilities that you're going to give him in 5e relate to that. And even his, his abilities already in 5e relate to that. Shadow Dark combats are fast, grim, and often very lethal, right? You don't want to make the mistake of trying to buff him up in terms of making him last longer. Because if a battle is going on a long time in Shadow Dark, the players are all going to die. But you also don't want to make the mistake of making Strahd a normal vampire from the book with no other changes. He's special. He should be special. So you want to buff him up a little bit. But again, you have to thread this needle. If you buff him up too much in combat, then he's just going to wipe any party of Shadow Dark adventurers. Um, vampires are already very hard in combat. But you don't want to make him a normal vampire. So focus on giving him utility and out-of-combat abilities. Focus on giving him things that make him more like sort of background villain or front and center villain that Curse of Strahd has him be in 5e without changing a lot about the combat abilities of the Shattered Dark, Shattered Dark vampires. Um, Believe me, his charm, drain, and shape change abilities are sufficient to make him a, a very lethal threat in combat already. Because the temptation, again, is to make him this warrior and to give him, or a sorcerer, or to give him, you know, a bunch of extra abilities and hit points and damage attacks and special attacks in combat. And that's just not the way Shadow Dark combats work so much. Shadow Dark combats are sort of a last resort, right? You don't want to have to fight unless you absolutely have to. Whereas 5e combat is kind of the name of the game. That's been true for the last few editions, at the very least. Um, and so, again, giving Strahd all these combat abilities, giving him all these different, uh, you know, things that you can make him do. It's tempting. But it's only tempting if you kind of don't understand the difference between Shadow Dark and 5e in terms of the way that combat works. Um, so, as an example, you guys can pause the video here if you want and look at... This is, this is the stat block that I developed for Strahd von Zerovich. As you can see, I kept his base stats basically the same as in Shadow Dark. He's going to get three attacks. He's going to get a plus eight to hit, which means he's basically hitting every single time, or at least half the time, against very heavily armored people. And he's got that D8 damage, which is very, very strong, plus Blood Drain. And I'm going to talk about why that's particularly dangerous in my game. We'll talk about some of the changes you're going to make later. As you can see, he's immune to morale checks, and he's only damaged by magical sources, which again is very tough, and I wanted to keep that in Shadow Dark as well. The Blood Drain means that he's going to get his hit points back and the enemy is going to be losing Khan really, really deadly. Plus, this Charm ability is so strong, you got to use this and use this and use this. The players are going to have to be very clever in order to get around Strahd with this Charm effect because there's no limitation. You can keep trying it and keep trying it and keep trying it. 
Dire Shape Change is great because it gives you the ability to run much faster as a wolf or fly as a giant bat. And so, you know, he's not going to be floating around um, just, you know, <laughs> like a Sith Lord or something like that in combat. Um, he is going to be... Uh, he's going to be turning into a giant bat and flying around. And then I gave him this turn into Cloud of Fog ability when he reduces to zero hit points so that he goes to his coffin and reforms. And if they do manage to beat him in combat, this is the chance to grab him. Holy Magic targeting him is much harder to cast. If you've got clerics in your party, if you've got uh, a, a vampire, uh, someone who can turn on debt, very, very hard. That spell is probably not going to succeed. And even if it does, it's going to have to be an 18, 19, or 20. He's going to get a plus 5 to that check. I might give him advantage. Yeah, I don't have that written down here, but you might. So the turning Strahd is very hard, and you're really not going to be able to turn him to the point where he's going to be destroyed. Might even make that a, a base condition. And then, as you can see, I gave Strahd these uh, once-per-day actions. Really, this is once-per-encounter actions. Because I wanted to give this sense of him as a very powerful undead. And as you can see, they're, they're not directly damaging. Now, he has Dispel Magic. He does have Fly. So if, he does, if you do want him to fly around as a Sith Lord, you certainly can. But it's only once per day. Gaseous Form, again, once per day. Mirror Image, six images. Very, very strong. Which Strahd is Strahd? Silence, as a focus ability. And then Sleep. And these are mostly out of combat. Uh, sleep is not going to affect most parties once they get to a high level. But it's still a useful ability to have, to take care of henchmen, to take care of hirelings, anybody in the background that they may have gathered. Strahd can, with a wave of his hand, put them into a deep sleep. Great to use. And then, of course, he has his vampire ability there. What this will do, I think, is it'll turn Strahd into a much more challenging uh, fight to get to. Because he has these out-of-combat abilities, because he has things like Silence and Sleep, Fly, Gaseous Form, and Mirror Image, unless you track him down and prepare and get that fight all going, you're just not going to kill him. And that's the goal here. I didn't want to make his actual fight something you can't do, but Strahd is the kind of villain who is going to be ready for you. He is not going to be the one that uh, you stumble on, kill him in a random encounter, and that's that. Strahd is prepared for you, and if he's not prepared for you, he gets out of there. The next thing you're going to want to do is focus on fear instead of damage. Now, in a gothic horror setting, which is what Curse of Strahd is, fear and dread are the goal. As such, you want to try to build in a stress system that mirrors a normal game's hit point system and focus on that rather than hit points. This is sort of like Call of Cthulhu or any of those other sort of sanity-based horror games. The focus isn't on the moment-to-moment -moment combat. Rather, the focus is more on the building up of terror and dread. Now, I don't say ignore combat. Even in a Call of Cthulhu game, combat is an important point. But combat is there for the big set pieces and the release of terror, as opposed to the building up of dread, rather than just random casual combat. Shadow Dark is really, really good at those fast, lethal combats. But it doesn't have the same sort of attrition system that 5e has. Hit dice, many spell slots, etc. So you don't want to throw lots of little combats at them, because... Any combat in Shadow Dark, especially at low level, can be very lethal. And even as you get higher, combats have the same sort of lethality to them as the monsters get stronger and stronger along with you. So that means unless you're willing in a story-based gothic horror game like Curse of Strahd to kill a party on a random encounter, um, which I don't think you should be, you should save combat for those big important moments when they encounter some sort of undead or when you're willing for a player to die in that combat you got to be careful. Now, I'll talk more about how to balance this out a little bit later. Now, does this mean there should be no danger for exploration? No, absolutely not. There has to be risk, right? And that risk is stress. Stress and the resulting debuffs make inevitable combats that much more stressful for the players, not just the characters, right? And it builds tension. So instead of the random encounter with the skeleton or the ghost being about draining hit points and spell slots, and making, you make it about gaining and managing stress which is a sort of secondary hit point system. Now, in my game, I have a sort of developed system based on uh, sort of like Darkest Dungeon, where you start off with zero stress, and as you see horrific things, as you enter into combat, as you take critical hits in combat, that sort of thing, your stress starts to go up. And when it equals your wisdom, then you become uh, stressed. 
And stressed is a pretty minor debuff, but when you get two times your wisdom score of stress, when that number ch chucks up there, then you become terrified. And terrified characters have to make a choice. This is another thing you want to avoid. You want to avoid taking control of the player characters themselves. Let the players always be in charge. It's one of my problems with fear from 5e is that you simply have to run away or, or, or you, know, you, you, you have this um, resulting debuff if you can't. It's really rough. So in my system that I've developed, I have a choice. You can either run away and immediately heal some stress, but you have to run away for d6 rounds. You can choose. That's the player gets to choose what happens to their character. Or the character fights through it and continues to go, but they take an immediate punch of stress, extra stress, and uh, that will come into play later. And Or they can choose to freeze and see what happens. They don't run away. They don't get that initial bunch of stress, but they freeze up and they make the check again the next turn. So when stress builds up, they have to make a check, and if they fail, then they have to make this choice. Now, getting an extra punch of stress is really bad because if they ever get to three times their base wisdom score in stress, then they immediately go to zero hit points. They're incapacitated. And they'll have to work, if they survive, they have to work with the DM to create a sort of new quirk and madness for, their, for their, the source of their stress. So this is a really good system, I think, um, for building in and managing this stress rather than Focusing on damage. Now, if they happen to take some damage in these sort of encounters that you run at them throughout the game, that's fine. But the focus should be on building and managing stress because if it's too high, then in a big combat, it might just make them start to lose their minds and then that will kill them. Now, it's also, as I said, okay if it happens to do some damage because this leads us into the next thing you should change about your Curse of Strahd adventures. The third thing you're going to want to change is the hit point system. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the fast, lethal way that combat works in Shadow Dark. But in a story-based game, in a game where you're dealing with more of a narrative, you want those characters to be around for the entirety of the gothic horror story. Maybe one of them dies, maybe two of them die, but you don't want a TPK. And in Shadow Dark, it's very possible, especially if you just transfer Curse of Strahd directly over. It's very possible to have a TPK because of the way the combat works. So I say change the hit point system into something like Into the Odd or the Cairn system, where you divide your hit points between grit and flesh. Now, simply put, you, grit and flesh are just, again, two ways of thinking about your health. You can look up uh, more about this online. There are lots of people who have talked about this. But uh, in, in brief, your hit points stay the same, but you consider them differently. You consider your hit points as something like grit. They're your, your drive, your, your, your how, how tired you are. Hit points come and go, right? They get knocked down, and they go right back up after every rest. But flesh is what happens when you take some serious damage. Flesh is your constitution score. Now, when your hit points go to zero, you don't just pass out or start making death saves. Rather, or you're, you know, in Shadow Dark, you don't make that death timer. Rather... In my system, you take a shock test, which is a hard constitution check, and if you pass, you can keep fighting. But any subsequent damage that you take comes out of your constitution score rather than your hit points, because your hit points are at zero. So say I'm at five hit points and I take eight damage, well, then I go to zero hit points, and then I lose three con as well. So if I was at 10 con, now I'm at seven con. I've lost flesh. Narratively speaking, your character wasn't just winded, your character was actually wounded. The werewolf got a chunk of his, of his uh, stomach, right? <laughs> or took a bite out of his arm. Now, this does two things. Narratively, it explains how a rest heals a character to full hit points, um, while also building in an injury system that is able to be used narratively as well. A character is only narratively harmed when flesh or con is lost. So you can use that in your descriptions of the battle. That's one thing it does. But it also makes undead much more terrifying. Anything that drains con directly goes straight to your base hit points because now it's, it's, it's sort of a double cost. It's a double tax. It's, you lose hit points when you get bit and you lose con, which means you're losing both your shield and your real health. And players, not just characters, but players will fear to face undead and you won't have to resort to the loss of XP or level drain like old systems used to do in order to make that same effect. Now, again, what's the point of doing this? Well, it does a few things. First of all, it builds in a sort of long-term um, 
attrition that your characters have to deal with. Because Shattered Dark doesn't really have this, right? On any rest in Shattered Dark, you come right back to full. Full hit points, and all of your slots are back. In a dungeon delve, that's great. But in a narrative-based game, you want your characters to start to deal with these longer-term effects. Further, in Shadow Dark, because you have to change the way combat works significantly and focus on fear and sanity, you want those combats to be meaningful. So, when a combat is meaningful, those creatures do some damage to you. Yeah, your hit points go down, they're going to come right back up. But if that creature manages to get to your con score, well, now you have a longer-term problem. Now, your con score will go up one point per rest. Maybe you can add in some conditions, like if they have a doctor, it'll go up faster or something like that. But the point here is, those combats, while there will be fewer and further between, are still meaningful, not just because of the stress that they will deal, but because if those creatures manage to get to your con score, well, now you're in further trouble. And if you have to do those big set-piece battles with lower con, you're going to be in serious danger. You're going to play your character differently. And that's cool, because it makes the players have a reason to choose this or that uh, you know, character decision moment based on how much health they have. They'll roleplay their characters as being injured. That's really good. Okay, so change the hit point system into, into the Odd and Karen system, and I think you'll see a really... Uh, along with the change to focus on fear and sanity. Fewer combats um, that are more important. And these two things will go hand in hand and create a system that makes those individual combats much more interesting, uh, much more uh, terrifying for the players, without completely undoing um, without ignoring combat entirely. The fourth thing that you're going to want to do in response to these other changes is change the XP system. Now, Shadow Dark focuses on... There's two real ways that it says you can do... Well, three, I suppose. It says you can do uh, treasure, which is the base system. You get XP for certain kinds and qualities of treasure. Zero XP for trivial treasure, one XP for useful or good treasure, three XP for epic treasure, and ten XP for legendary treasure. This is a really good system for dungeon delves and for games, and it has a really good argument behind it. It gives players uh, freedom to try to think their way past monsters rather than simply through monsters in combat, which is awesome. But in a game like Curse of Strahd, you don't want treasure to be the driving goal. First of all, there isn't that much in Barovia. You could add it, but there's not a whole lot to do with it. Carousing doesn't really fit at least the gothic horror vibe, and so having treasure, which then you spend to carouse, just doesn't fit very well. Now, the other option you can do is something like Milestones, right, where you get certain experience points for doing important things, and that works totally well. Alongside that, you have this sort of monster hunter way of doing experience points, where you get experience points for killing creatures, and you get experience points based on the kinds of creatures that you kill, and all of these things, the level of the creature that you kill. All good and all solid ways of doing experience, but for Curse of Strahd, which is a much more exploration, roleplay, and narrative-based game, you want something a bit better uh, suited to that narrative exploration. And so I say go with something like milestones, but break it down. Change the XP system from treasure to goals. So instead of just getting a level when they accomplish something big, they get XP for accomplishing goals. And you can keep the same names for those tiers of goals that Shattered Dark has for tiers of treasure. Zero XP for trivial goals, right? Things like finding out where the merchant is or, or, or getting a discount on a particular item that they, you want to buy. Finding out, you know, which building is the church and finding out something about the history of the church. You get one XP for useful things or good things, things that move the story forward, things that move the character's goals forward in a significant way. And that might be convincing the guard to let you pass. That might be um, finding the key to the front gate. That might be finding a back entrance that no one else has seen. But these might be, these are good goals, uh, go, good steps in your goal, in achieving your goals. You can get 3 XP for epic goals, right? Things that are really, really significant. Or 10 for anything that might be legendary. And again, there's going to be a little bit of negotiation between you and your players as to what qualifies as useful or trivial, epic, etc. That's okay. Just, I would say, err on the side of being generous. Shadow Dark is a pretty dangerous system, even with the changes that I suggest adding. And you're going to want to make sure that you have this, uh, you know, XP system as something that will be useful to the players. Now, I think what this does is it focuses, or rather refocuses players, on recognizing that they can 
get through Barovia how they want. It's an old adage, right? But players will do what they're rewarded to do. So if you want players to go around monster hunting, then give XP for killing monsters. If you want players to get treasure, give XP for getting treasure. If you want players to follow your story, then only give XP when they follow your story. But I think that this is more broad than any of those, and it allows the players to pick their own path forward and to realize that there is no right way to do this adventure. It encourages the more sandbox feel, which Curse of Strahd is open to, and I think which Shadow Dark is better suited to dealing with. Okay, that is number four. Number five is add in roles. Now, roles are not pre-made characters or sort of free-form character generation, as we're usually used to, and it certainly isn't the random style of character generation that is rules as written Shadow Dark. Rather, roles are useful um, as a way of giving players hooks into the into the world, into the theme. When I say roles, I mean something like thematic archetypes that players can hook their character concepts into. Now, when playing a, a, a genre game like Gothic Horror, players often need a little direction from you as to what tone you're setting. Character roles give them that direction. You know, what I mean by this, again, is something like the, the investigator, right? Someone who is seeking out what is happening in the world. If you, if you create a class that is the investigator with abilities that are attached to it, okay, fair enough. Or you add it as a background, they'll get skill modifiers. But I mean separate from either backgrounds or classes, roles are sort of, again, word description archetypes that the players know are in that genre. The innocent. Someone who is plagued by curses. Someone who's plagued by nightmares, but who themselves are good and wholesome. And again, this isn't a class, this isn't a background so much. You can add those in, but rather this is a way of thinking about the, your character and the way that they will play into the gothic horror theme of the adventure. The genre games, and again, Curse of Strahd is a genre game. It is a gothic horror adventure. It's not sword and sorcery. It's not high fantasy. It's not grimdark. It is gothic horror, at least as written. And I think it lends itself very well to that tone, that genre. Then you want to build these in as a ways, again, for helpful to the players. It's also useful for you as the GM because it lets you start the world building, campaign crafting, adventure planning ahead of time without totally waiting for the players to make their characters and then fit uh, the campaign around them, right? It's really, really easy to make a campaign that has nothing to do with the characters, right? <laughs> and then they make their characters and you kind of try to have to shoehorn them in. Or vice versa, if you're going to wait for the players to make all of their characters and build the whole campaign around them, then you can't really get started with your story. And also, it feels it can often feel a little bit too tailor-fit, that the world is somehow made for exactly the characters and their world. Rather, what this does is it lets them build their own characters into the story. Now, warning, do not make these pre-made characters, unless that's a thing your table likes or would like. Rather, what I, when I did this, I came up with a title and a 5 to 10 word descriptor and nothing else. Here's an example of what I mean. These were the ones that I used. Obviously, they're inspiration here from Darkest Dungeon uh, and el elsewhere. But you can see what I mean by this. I had ideas about what these meant, but they weren't concrete ideas, and they were subject to change by the PCs during character creation or after. Um, I, I added in number 10, just as an option if, if no one, if a player or two didn't want to do any of these. But all of my players, when I did this, picked one of these roles. Now, this is separate from background and separate from class. So I had a priest who was a noble as a background, and he chose the descendant. Now that ties him into the world, but when he chose that, I had ideas about who that great hero might be. But the relation, how much knowledge he had about that hero, and what precisely that hero meant for the Barovians, that was all up in the air, and I was willing to change even what I had if he had a better idea or an idea about how it would tie in. But this was just a way of giving him a hook into the world and a way of saying, hey, here are the kinds of thematic uh, touchstones that I'm looking at. And that way you, as a player, can get a sense of what my world that I'm building up will be like. Okay, so those are five things that I recommend changing. Some of them are, some of them are about Shadow Dark, some of them are things just adding in, some of them are just sort of changes you want to make to the whole system. But I think if you do these five things, you will have a very, very successful adventure assuming your players are, you know, all good and all that. All right, well, hope this has been useful, helpful, and I'll see you guys in another video.